two, one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Inside Movies Galore. I'm your host, David Streggy. I have director Mark Byrne from Absurd Film Correction uh, 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 Productions, correct? Uh, Absurd Productions Pictures. Correct. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, self and how you got involved in the independent film industry? Well, actually, uh, ironically enough, I got started, um, this is their 20th anniversary, and so prior to starting APP 20 years ago, I actually got started in film doing public access, and some friends of mine from high school had gotten a charter with the public access company, and I joined them, and we wrote and did everything for a series of, of uh vignettes or scenes that we would do. We did drama, we did comedy, we did uh, documentary. We tried to do a little bit of everything. And, uh, and plus everyone learned, had to act, everybody had to direct, everybody had to write, everybody had to do everything. And I was really the, me and one other guy really were the two that were really the most interested in doing it. And, and even after that ended, even the other guy quit. But I had already gotten everything set up to start APP as soon as the show ended. So as soon as that ended, I, I already had uh, two scripts. I had a feature and a short and also had two uh, concepts that weren't scripted out. So when I began APP, we, we started with those films and uh, I did the short the, the short comedy first. And then uh, the next thing I did uh, was a noir, this uh, picture you can see up behind me right here. Uh, okay. Because I wanted to do that. It wasn't one of the four original ideas, but it was something I really wanted to do. And I was, you know, just like, how many of these films am I going to get to do? You just never know when you're starting out. So I, I really wanted to do the noir because that's that's really my my biggest interest in in, in a genre is is noir. I don't think I've ever seen a bad film noir. So I really wanted to do that. And then after I did that, um, I did a horror, a short horror, because once again, after spending so much time on a drama, and it took years and years. I wanted something I could flip quickly in a horror film. Uh, it was easy to flip and it was outside. And it was all action and a lot of dialogue. So I did that. And then once I got that done, I came back to the um, original ideas, the three that were still sitting out there, finished those. And then I kind of, that's kind of phase one of the company, the first 10 years. The second 10 years, I focused more on uh, the more traditional genres that you, you see in independent film, which is horror, comedy, and horror comedy. And uh, I, I really wanted to do those because I felt like uh, a lot of people are not going to watch a black and white movie. They're not going to watch mm -hmm. a drinking drama. They're not going to watch an Orwellian type of thing. It's just too outside the box for them. So I wanted to do things that would draw people in. And I hope when I, once I got them in that I could then interest them in some of these other genres. Uh, and plus, you know, horror movies are fun. Comedies are fun. They're, they're, all these genres are fun to do. So uh, I like to mix it up, keep everything fresh for me and, and hopefully for the audience. Uh, if I'm bored, I think everybody else is going to be bored. Okay. Um, so what kinds of uh, horror films uh, started you out? Uh, like, uh, as, as a, uh, what, what kind of uh, films inspired you to, uh, to eventually make films? <laughs> well, probably my favorite, and I know some people wouldn't call this a horror film. It, it could also be science fiction, but but definitely my favorite one is Alien. That that's something. The very first time I saw that, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And so there's a couple of elements in in out there. The short horror I did, which actually behind me here too, right, the red <laughs> one there. Um, there are actually a couple of elements in that from Alien. Uh, if you and I'll, I'll even tell you, uh, if you remember when Harry Dean Stanton's character got killed uh, when he was looking for the cat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of uh, did a homage to that in in, uh, in in out there where one of the characters goes off and and is looking for her uh, boyfriend and and the creatures uh, kind of get her and she's kind of frozen like he was. I just thought that was such a powerful moment where he was frozen. Of course, and you're like, you don't want Harry <laughs> Dean Stanton to get killed. Everybody loves Harry Dean right. Stanton, right? And it's like, no, don't kill him. <laughs> so, 
but I love that movie. That's still that's still one I can watch today and, and almost feel like it's the first time. And the other another one, and once again, this isn't one that most people are going to name, but because uh, it's so old. But I mean, really, horror really changed in 1960 with a movie called Psycho. And okay. it, it really changed. It was not like that prior to that. And of course, Hitchcock's movies changed. And and that's a very influential movie um, just because I think it influenced really everything that happened after that. So mm -hmm. the horror that you and I know started before we were born with Psycho, I think. I really think that changed um, the, the, te the horror to go in the direction that it's gone a lot more violent and brutal and, um, and, and, you know, positive, you know, definitely all positives the way it went. So th those are two that I would name as, as influential. Okay. Um, going into some of your first projects here. Um, um, uh, by the way, uh, that was a very good video um, um, uh, promotion thing that you had up on uh, 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 Vimeo, um, uh, by the way. Um, so sm uh, uh, Small Fish, Small Pond was your first uh, uh, f uh, film, technically. Um, and uh, w when did you uh, first get involved with uh, putting that uh, production together? Well, uh, I wrote it uh, before, you know, well before I started, I actually wrote it back when we were doing the public access. And um, I didn't, when I got in, like I said, I wanted to do the noir, so I kind of put it on the shelf. And uh, I, it had been sitting on the shelf for quite a while. And we got access to an Irish actor named Barry McAvoy. He, uh, he actually wrote a screenplay and sold it in Hollywood and Barry Levinson directed it, and he got to star in the movie. He's a theater actor, so he's not super well known. Uh, in, in the movie industry, but uh, you know, he's a, he's a big name to get for a little independent company. And he was going to be here doing a play and he had agreed I'd send him uh, some of the scenes and he had agreed to do it. And we also got to shoot over there on the soundstage. But in order to do that, I had to be ready to go. So that's really what got me to put that script back to the front uh, because we had access to Barry and we had access to that great, um, what I call the Ireland bar in the movie. Um, <laughs> And it's like a big wooden bar that they built on the stage. It's all, a, uh, you know, it was all on a stage. So nice. It was great because you know that's it's open on one end, like Hollywood, where we can move the camera wherever we wanted, and the sound mm -hmm. was really good and everything. So uh, that that made me uh, move forward. You know, I already had the script written, but I had to. Um, I had three different versions, and each one ran over two hours. So if I'd have shot everything I had, it'd have been a three and a half hour movie. You just can't do that. So no. I wanted an hour and a half movie. So I had to cut a lot of stuff out. And then I actually had to add a, a few things to to kind of fill in for what I'd cut. But mm -hmm. it's a much better movie at, at 85 minutes than it would have been. Those long versions were just too long. It just it just <laughs> went on too long. So that's what got me um, in it was to get Barry. And then we shot Barry's stuff first because he was only here for a couple months. And then we shot the rest of it. Uh, and most of it took place in bars. So it was really it was really fairly easy to do. We didn't have all uh, 50 locations like like my more current movies do. So it was really okay. three major bars and a couple outside scenes. But it was a ton of fun to do. And the cast, all the cast loved it. We used a lot of theater actors from the D.C. area. Um, and, and theater people tend to like it better than than independent people do. You know, dramas tend to do better with theater people anyway, I think. OK. Uh, and once it came out, uh, what kind of reception did it have with the local uh, film community? It, it actually had a pretty strong uh, reception. I, I was I, I didn't know how people were going to perceive it because once again, it's not a whole lot of action in mm -hmm. it. It's more talking and and uh, but a lot of people related to it. A lot of people knew a person that was like that, or they were like that. You know, it's about a bunch of people in a bar, kind of talking mm -hmm. trash and and uh, talking about what they're going to do, <laughs> and then they come back the next day and there they are in the bar again. You know. Okay. But it turned out the guy, despite all his talk, was actually, he really was writing in the background. So it turned out that he really was doing everything he said, <laughs> which was kind of the irony of it. Nice. Uh, so ultimately, um, the next film uh, that you got, uh, 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 got into uh, doing was called The Worker Bees, correct? Uh, actually, The Worker Bees was the, the first, the very first film I did. That was... Okay. Um, one of the two original screenplays I had that in Small Fish, Small Pond. And okay. yeah, the Worker Bees was was kind of it was kind of based on my experiences that I'd had where there would be a lot of trivial stuff going on at, at work that just made the job horrible, um, whether it be somebody constantly riding you or 
are, are, are running behind your back to tell the boss. And, and so I created these characters that basically were the stereotypes that you would find at work, the, all the bad ones, right? So you have the ass kisser, you have the, um, the braggart, you have the, the, um, the narc or the whatever the other word you'd use for that. And, um, and then you had the complainer basically. And so the complainer was more or less me, but I didn't play the character. <laughs> I played the boss. <laughs> so I, it was too easy for me to be the complainer, but I, I told the guy that played that role, I said, you know, this, this is my favorite role in the movie. I'm telling you that. I'm... Okay. Um, so ultimately where exactly did you f uh, film uh, these first t uh, two fil uh, fil uh, films? Did you film them in uh, where you're living now or? Yeah, we rented a, um, a conference room for, for worker bees that that all took place in a conference room. And then we went down into D.C. and shot at, at the uh, the Arboretum down there for the outside scene at the end. But all the rest of it took place. Uh, so that was just like maybe two days of shooting and, and we had most of it done um, okay. for the other uh, for Taste of Desperation. That was shot uh, in D.C., downtown D.C. Um, okay. And a, a little bit outside of D.C. But, you know, the good thing about that movie um uh, DC does not look like that anymore. This was before the Verizon Center was built. So it was kind of run down down there now where it's all glitz and gram glamour. So it it, it, it kind of captures an era just like Noir captures an era. So I'm, I'm really glad that we got that era of DC uh, on, on film. So um, you, you mentioned uh, Taste of Desperation. Um, uh, what made you... Uh, decide to uh, go into a black and white f uh, film. Do you prefer black and white uh, to color or? Uh, I'm not gonna say I prefer it, but once again, black and white to me is so artistic in, in photography or in film and the, the darks and the lights and the, and the colors. And then the way Noor does with like light coming through like a window shade and, and mm -hmm. it just, I just, the, the artistic aspects of it are just so strong. And you know, if you're going to do a noir, you have to do black and white, in my opinion. I know Chinatown. There's a few exceptions, but um, I, I never considered doing it in color. I, I wanted to to do that. And as much as I love black and white, I haven't done one since because it's just not realistic to be a, a filmmaker in 2021 making black and white films. I mean, you can make every tenth one a black and white, but you re you really can't get away with doing that every time. The audience that would watch it is so small and so old that <laughs> <laughs> you're just not gonna. Understandable. Uh, so ultimately, with uh, Taste of Desperation, uh, did you end up working with some of the actors and actresses that you worked with uh, in Worker Bees and uh, Small Fish, Small Pond? Uh, well, most of the actors in Worker Bees, uh, that was kind of a one-off. I think one of the actors from the Worker Bees came back for Taste of Desperation, but okay. we, we kind of went... Um, uh, we went with some different folks, so we got a lot of people that uh, that I worked with that I never worked with again. Um, mm. It was an older cast because you know a lot a lot of the, and and funny thing is a lot of the older actors were were begging me to be in the movie because they love Noor and they were like oh I got to be in this movie you know <laughs> I never get an offer like this so it, the cast tended to be a little bit older than the Worker Bees cast was younger okay. so um, and in terms of Small Fish Small Pond let's see yeah there were. Um, yeah, one of the the actor who starred in Small Fish Small Pond actually was in um, Taste of Desperation, and there were a couple of other actors from Small Fish, but uh, a lot of the Small Fish actors were new too. We brought in, uh, and and for that one we brought in more theater people. So it kind of each movie kind of it, it really depends on who we need to fit that that film, yeah, genre. Okay, um, I guess I'll ask you about um, Out There. Uh, mm -hmm. Forbidden Room and Too Many, and how you got involved with those film projects. Okay, well, each of those are those are the three shorts that we did, uh, the, along with uh, uh, the Worker Bees. Those are the four shorts that we did. So, without there, the the reason I got into that is I met a guy named Marvin Kennedy who who worked with Conrad Brooks. So I worked, met him on the set um, for for the first uh, Gypsy Vampire movie. And okay. uh, he wanted to work with us and he loves horror and I knew everybody loved horror. And I was like, oh, you know, after making people sit through a, a, an hour and a half of talking and drama in, in the, um, the, in the nor, I felt like, you know, let's do something totally different. Let's not be inside at all. The whole movie took place outside. And like I said, it was quick to shoot and it was all action. And, and so that's really what the reason I did that one. 
Forbidden Room and Too Many were the other two concept ideas that I had when I started the company. So I definitely wanted to finish those. Forbidden okay. Room was a long, an old idea I'd had. I don't remember what uh, what made me come up with it, but it was kind of about uh, a person uh, goes into a house and there's a, and there's one room where they're not told they're told not they can't go and no one goes in there. And of course they wake <laughs> up and there's all these noises coming out of that room and lights and everything. And so it's kind of a siren to draw you know, almost like a Venus flytrap to draw people in, you know, what's in there, I got to know. And so one by one, the people start going in the room. And of course, once you go in, you never come out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of the basis of that one. That one also is kind of a homage to, to uh, Psycho in a way. Uh, if, okay. if you see the movie, you'll probably catch it. Too Many um, is, is interesting. That is based on something that really happened. I mm -hmm. saw uh, my twin in Paris at the Metro. Okay. And it's not something... Um, that you want to do, in my opinion, it's <laughs> it's scary, and because my brain just starts going, oh, you know, only one of us can exist, and da 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 da. So I didn't want the guy to see me because I, you know, he might have had superpowers or whatever. It's weird, so I can't I can't mm -hmm. really explain it unless it's happened to you. So I just kind of took what happened to me, which was basically nothing, and blew it up into be well, what if those two people acknowledged each other? You know, only one of them could survive. So it turned out the good he had kind of a good side and an evil side, and and your personality is going to be taken by the other one. So that's kind of what that was about. It was, it was kind of taking something that happened to me and blowing it up to make it interesting enough to be a, a story. Okay. And how has your reception been with some, uh, 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 with some of the rest of these? Uh, well, you know, with, with, uh, without there, it's always been really, really high. Cause it's a, uh, it's a um, horror film. So, you know, everybody loves horror films. Uh, Forbidden room uh, did, did well. Uh, it, it's a, uh, it's it's longer. It's only forty five minutes long, but for short, that's pretty long. It's mm -hmm. longer and it's it's more PG rated. So the horror crowd liked it, but um, actually, the people that don't really like horror but want to be kind of on this edge of their seat, a lot of those people gravitate towards um, Forbidden Room because it is rated PG. There's no cussing or nudity or anything like that in it. And uh, and then for I'm sorry, what was the other one? Too many. Yep. What was the question? Oh, it was basically what was the reception? To, uh, oh, the reception. What, what, and once again, the reception to that was really strong. The, the first time we, we showed that, we actually have, you know, you have a little Q&A after. And usually the Q&A is, you know, one or two people. Yeah. People were, everybody was philosophizing about, oh, I can see why it would be scary. And, oh, why didn't you go over and say hi? And, you know, so we sat in there for the movie was only like 18 minutes. We sat in there for like 40 minutes afterwards talking <laughs> about it. And about oh, what would you do? What would you, you know? <laughs> it was, it's never happened before. It was just everybody was intrigued by that, and we had a huge crowd for that. I was I was surprised. It's short. I figured you know you'll get ten people, but a lot audiences, of people were intrigued by it. Audiences are interesting, uh, especially. I mean, it, it's it's one thing to put uh, what you want to a, fi a film onto a screen. It's another to entertain your audience and get the reaction that uh, that you want. And it sounds like you got your somewhat reaction uh, uh, there, uh, there to the films. So that's cool. Um, did, uh, okay, so after those films, you did a film called Subconscious Reality, correct? Yes. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit how you got involved with that project? Well, that was kind of uh, when I was working uh, and finished um, Small Fish, Small Pond, which was my first screenplay, you know, that was critical that I get that done. It was critical to get the Noir done. So once those two things were done, this was kind of the next big idea I had. And I wanted to do what I called a paranoid government, kind of an Orwellian, Philip K. Dickian um, uh, talk about. Imagine if uh, if you had a corpocracy kind of like we have today, only it was more brutal. And if you don't have worth in society, you're eliminated. And then even if you do have worth, if you run against, you know, what the politics or the finances that we support, then you're eliminated. And you just keep eliminating until the only thing left is the elites and their protectors, the assassins. And so that's where so rather than start, it's post apocalyptic. So I didn't start with how all these people got eliminated. They're already gone. So we start out where you've got a board, a conglomerate board that runs the world. And now who's left to go after of course, they're assassins because right. they start to worry, well, hey, these assassins don't have anybody to kill. They're going to come after us, so we're going to go after them. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of becomes a cat and mouse game uh, of, of catching uh, someone they think is, is ratting them out. And, and an underground has formed. 
and the underground eventually is going to take on the corpocracy and, and try to establish freedom. So they create a, a little place where they can grow their own food and they can protect themselves. And um, so it's kind of those two things are, are, are going against each other in the movie. We also in that film, uh, that was the first time we broke out of the, the D.C. metro area. We started we shot up in two places in New York. We shot in West Virginia. We shot in uh, uh, Upper Maryland. We shot Pennsylvania. And we also brought in um, our biggest celebrity, Lana Wood from uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Plenty, she That's was plenty cool. of cool. And was we also got her. Conrad Brooks back. He, Conrad had been in Taste of Desperation and we were able to get him back for the film. So it was kind of uh, at that point in time, it was our biggest cast and mm -hmm. it was also our biggest film in terms of locations. And I mean, like like I mentioned, the, the, the horror film that out there where we had like one or two locations. Uh, in that movie, we had like nine different locations in five states that were major locations where we shot. So we had a lot of travel and uh, it was all worth it because I wanted those those really cool locations we had. And okay. uh, and, and it, it really turned out. Um, and that, you know, that's one where uh, the audience, it's a lot of people don't. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow. You might have to watch it a couple times. Um, but some people, once again, some people just get it right off and love it. And other people are, are, are like, well, I didn't really understand, you know, this and that about it. So that one kind of got a mixed reaction. Okay. And I've since redone, uh, reworked it. I, I trimmed down maybe about seven or eight minutes out of it. Cause I think a couple of places it ran a little long and okay. I also darkened the whole film. Cause I think I made it a little too light. So, okay. um, uh, next time the film is available somewhere that, that new version will be available. All righty. Well, um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask is uh, if, if there were a couple of moments from the films that we've talked about so far, uh, if there were a couple of moments that you could take from making these uh, the, uh, these uh, films, what would you take from your adventures so far, uh, so far up to this point? So you, you want like a, a, an interesting story or more what I, what I learned and took forward? Maybe a little of both. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the, I'll give you the interesting story first. Uh, in, in Taste of Desperation, uh, there was an actor who was supposed to kill somebody, and that actor, the actor he was killing wasn't there, so I, I basically he would attack the camera, and then I shot with the other actor. So both of them played against the camera, and we shot it in a cemetery at night. And so we were shooting, and I was facing the where the, where the uh, cars could come in so mm -hmm. I could see if anybody came in. And so I see a car turn and I was like, here, here comes somebody. So we just, we had it already planned. So we pulled the equipment down and duck into the bushes. And sure enough, it was a cop. And he was going <laughs> around slowly looking all around and we just kept moving around the bushes and everything. And then he finally got to the other end and, and, and went out. And, and then we just set the equipment back up and shot the rest of the scene. But I, I thought it was so funny that, that, uh, here we are, you know, girl style hiding under the bush behind a gravestone <laughs> to, to shoot the scene. And in terms okay. of what I took away, um, each film I learned something, you know, Taste of Desperation took six years to do because I, I got a brand new uh, system halfway through and I had to uh, I had to relearn that. I had to get everything to talk to each other. And I also had an audio um, sync problem. I had to resync the entire movie. You know, it took a long time to cast that one. It took a long time to shoot that one. And so I learned a lot of shortcuts on that because I was like, I can't take six years of movie. I'll, I'll only have been doing two or three movies in my life if I do it that way. Yeah. So I really learned a lot of quick uh, what not to do kind of, but also how to speed up things. Um, then with with uh, subconscious reality, really just the, the model that we kind of follow now is, is subconscious reality, which is we shoot all over the mid-Atlantic. We don't just shoot in the D.C. metro because we've shot so much around here that I really want to take advantage of locations out uh, in other areas. So we've shot out in in more rural areas out uh, out towards Hagerstown and towards Frederick and also uh, up towards Philly and Baltimore all, um, and in New York. So we kind of pick that up in, in subconscious reality. And then with Small Fish, Small Pond, in terms of what I learned there, it, it really was uh, – how to move more fa more quickly. That was their second uh, feature film. So I really wanted to get through the process more quickly without sacrificing quality, but I just didn't want something to take, you know, a year and a half to, to get all the shots done and all that. It just, that's just too long. So we got it done in like half the time. Okay. Uh, did you find it interesting as a filmmaker uh, when, I mean, I know you start out with like 
a specific camera but uh, but when you when you learn your pro, uh, process uh, did uh, what kind of camera did you start out with <laughs> it was a little sony camera um because I, I bought that camera because i didn't really care about the color quality because we were going to shoot it in black and white so um i really it was really what hookups it had in it and 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 the sound quality was fairly decent on it uh, but then when I was shooting color, that fa I found that that camera was woefully, um, you know, you need three CCDs and and all that. So then I moved up to the Canon and um, ended up getting a second Canon this, uh, from a friend of mine. Actually, a friend of mine had the, had the Canon camera and he, he told me, hey, come on over. You play around with it. I was like, yeah, this is what I want. So when I got it, I told him, I said, if you ever decide to get rid of this camera, let me know. Because, I mean, I <laughs> have the sister to it. And so, yeah, about five or six years later, he calls me up because you still want that camera. Yeah. <laughs> so I now have two of them, two Canon, uh, XH, uh, AIs. I think they are. Okay. Uh, I know it's always interesting. So, uh, 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 directors tend to like a certain camera to go with. Uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, uh, moving on to mismatch. Now that is the only one that, uh, that you have never put to, uh, physical media. Uh, That's it's been, uh, for free to show people exactly what you are capable of. Yes. Correct. Yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, about mismatch and what, uh, what it's all about? Well, sure. So I, 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 about 10 years ago, there was a show on TV and it was kind of, uh, these kind of ridiculous dating scenarios and it wasn't necessarily opposites, but a lot of times it was, it was just like somebody would do something. You're like, Oh, you can't be doing that. You're not going to, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I always thought that was funny and I never thought those shows were funny. And that was the one that actually made me laugh of all of them. And I said, well, you know, that might be an idea is to, is to take the game show reality show format and, and throw it on its ear and make it, you know, opposites um, are, are not going to work together. And it's not, a, not going to be a happy ending. And that's by design, which is kind of what that show was doing. But this is just straight up. They, they're purposely teaming people. So, for example, once it, kind of like uh, in the worker bees, I had these personalities. So you had a golfer, you had a player, you had a, a gossip, you had a, a, a girl. Um, and they and, and so, like, for example, the dirty girl and the cheap state, those two are not going to work. The goth and the player are not going to work. You know, uh, there was a conspiracy theorist. Now, the conspiracy theorist and the goth, they probably go good together. So... They, they purposely put everybody together so knowing they wouldn't work and then just kind of watched it explode. And, and that, that was kind of the, the theory behind it. And um, I wanted, to, as, as you had mentioned, I wanted to do that one to, to have, have it available for people to see because I felt like, you know, just having a few trailers and, and making everybody buy stuff. At some point, you got, you got to give people something and, and hopefully that will draw people in. And I, and I wanted it to be something approachable. So once again, this is a PG mismatch. Is a PG comedy. There's nothing in there that's going to offend anybody. It's not milk toast, but it's not going to be filled with you know f this and f that and and, and some people don't like that. So you know uh, th this is something that anybody can watch. You can watch it with your grandmother or your mother or whatever and, and not be offended. Definitely. Alrighty. So, uh, so, um, after mismatch, um, you went into a film, uh, called Bigfoot. <laughs> so, uh, why don't you tell me how you got involved in that project? Well, it's interesting. I, I've always been a fan of Bigfoot, um, going back to the, the movies I saw as a kid that were more the horror type. But now what you see is more of these reality um, shows, which I, I like. Uh, Finding Bigfoot, for example, is probably my favorite one. And um, so I, I had different, I, I had both, and, and we had an idea of a parody of Finding Bigfoot it was uh, that I ended up doing in the film, the first the first third of it. But it was, it was, I wanted to do both. I wanted to to play up on the horror things that I'd seen as a kid, but also play up on the current, um, which is more humor or or documentary style 
stuff that you're seeing on TV now. And there was just so many places for humor. So this became a movie that I, I'll never do anything like this again. It's just not going to be a place for it. But we actually did a little bit of everything. We did a parody of, uh, of reality shows, a par parody of society. We did uh, uh, like interactions with the Bigfoot and human. And then we had, you know, the straight up horror. Um, but I, I kind of call it absurdist humor, um, which kind of matches our, 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 our company title more so than any other movie. <laughs> but that's not what we normally do and, and probably not, not what we would ever do again. But I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, the cast had so much fun doing it. Um, and and the, the little story about uh, which I told in the uh, in, in the the promo I did, uh, I had been thinking about it for a while. But it, it, we went to this uh, costume store that it was going out of business and, and there were the suits and they were 40 percent off. And it was like <laughs> and my, my wife and I were there and I was like, all right, if I get these, we're going to do it. And, you know, I'm not going to buy them and sit in the closet. So it's like, all right, well, we, so we ended up getting them. And so that became the next movie. And like I said, I already had the humor part of it kind of set aside. I already knew I wanted to to make fun. And the part I made fun of was the where the where the guys would do the the the, 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 um, the yells across mm -hmm. the uh, they'd yell back and forth across the, the canyon to see mm -hmm. if a Bigfoot would answer. So in the parody, the Bigfoots were yelling back and forth to, to try to get the rednecks or the, the hillbillies to answer. And so they were stirring up an <laughs> argument over over which junior was better, Hank or Dale, and uh, <laughs> it kind of got them going on that. And and then you know they were all happy when they heard you know the, the humans talking back. You know, just if you'd ever seen Finding Bigfoot, you would you would get that right away. What I was trying to do there. Now, from what I understand, you got Jim Crute from uh, Dawn of the Dead involved with that uh, project. How did you uh, swing that one? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, it was a it was a day role, so um, it was easier to get Jim to do that. Um, he just had to come out there one day. He was interested in in, in the project, and um, he, he was in the horror part. I don't know how much he would have been interested in the comedy part, but um, you know, he was interested in the horror part, and uh, and we asked him about it, and and he agreed to do it. So we we're real excited to get him. And then, um, as we'll we'll mention later, we we then got to give him a much bigger part in the next film. Oh yeah, and that film also had um, Jennifer Rossi and Mel Heflin and um, Sonia Thompson. Um, yeah, so here's this is the next film, Remnants, and that's a straight horror. There's no comedy in that, and Jim is the star of that. He's the lead character. Uh, he plays a character uh, named Snap Nimzer, who who uh, who's rich, and he um, his niece is having problems with the spirit. And plus, he has an interest in spirits and things. And I, I won't say you find out at the end exactly what that is, but I won't mm -hmm. say what that is. But he, um, he he has the money to set up these things. And he's, he's found a way to move. And what a remnant is in terms of a spirit, it's not a, a, a ghost that's haunting a place and staying there and attacking people. A remnant is something that is left over from an act. So, for example, if, if someone got killed in this corner, there would be a remnant there, and it would be energy more so than than a than a, than a, a, a spirit in a in a sheet. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's an energy, and then certain people can tap into that energy, and certain people can even that in, when they tap into that energy, they are able to see either what happened, the death that occurred, or see the 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 thing that's lingering there. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, the reason that the the, the remnant is lingering is due to a human holding them there. So for example, if someone died in this corner and I was upstairs asleep and I didn't wake up, I might feel very guilty that, that I didn't get up and run down here. So maybe I'm the one holding the spirit in the place because of my guilt or because of my um, uh, remorse or because of, of, you know, because I know I'm guilty of killing the person. That could be another reason. Mm -hmm. So it, I wanted to do a different concept because once again, uh, paranormal movies have been done to death. There's millions of them, and I didn't want to do the same old thing. We've seen it more times. <laughs> than so I really wanted to take a different concept of what a spirit is, why they're here, and how you deal with them. And uh, then, on top of that, uh, everyone seems to be afraid of clowns. You know, the number one <laughs> listed as the scariest episode of Scooby Doo ever was the clown episode, <laughs> and, and they did a they did a survey. 
And the clown won like 60% of the vote. And I'm like, wow. And, and, and my wife is, is scared of clowns. I know a bunch of people. I know a friend of mine one time we went in a bar and he wouldn't look. There were clowns painted on the wall and he, he wouldn't look at the clowns. He, I'm gonna, he told uh, me, tell me which seat I can sit in so I'm not facing <laughs> a clown. <laughs> so I'm going to be. If that many people are scared of clowns, I got to have a clown. <laughs> and you said that was you? Uh, no. Um, I've actually. Uh, well, when I was a kid, I saw. Kill it clowns from outer space when I was like five years old. <laughs> so at the time, it scared the shit out of me. But um, uh, now to this day, it is like my all, all time favorite uh, uh, film if I had to dick. Because it, it, it's kind of like your conundrum of like sci fi, horror, and comedy all put together. It's yeah, like it, it is. It never it really knows is. what to be, you know, uh, yeah. what kind of genre to be. So to, uh, to me, you know that that was my thing, but uh, but you know, uh, films are different things to different people. So uh, so, um, I'm I'm glad that I actually did uh, did get a chance to pick up uh, up your uh, your films. They are entertaining. So what uh, what would you take from these last two films that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, you have? filmed um is there anything that you've learned from uh, from filmmaking with uh, with these characters yeah i mean uh, what i really wanted to do with these was um i wanted to i don't think you can just exist in a vacuum as a filmmaker and do things that only no. you like I, I i think you you know and, and you could say i no. did that with with uh, my first three features um, I, there is an audience for them, but it's not going to be remnants is going to have a bigger audience than those three films combined easily. So I really wanted to do things that I felt like I'd done things for me. Now I want to do things for everybody else, but I, I don't want to do the same old thing. I know a lot mm -hmm. of uh, that. You see a lot of that. A lot of people copying their favorite movie from the eighties or whatever. I, I mean, to me, I can watch that movie from the eighties. I don't need to make my own version <laughs> of it. But, you know, everybody can do what they want to do. And, and, and for me, I want to do something different. I want to do something that um, stands out, that we're not in Hollywood. We don't have to follow a set of, of, of genre rules where you have to have this, you have to do that, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, we can really go outside the box. So uh, I wanted to go outside the box, but yet stay within the parameters of a horror film or a comedy film or whatever it was doing. So I think what I really got from those last two films was, was kind of almost, it was almost like if you had a bunch of stocks in the stock market and, and, and you had a financial advisor told you, Hey, well, you better put some of that money into bonds or something. It was kind of like I had a bunch of money in one off dream projects and I needed to put it into um, the more standard genres that people expect to see. I mean, most people, I remember before I had a horror people come to the table when we'd set up and they go, Oh, do you have any horror films? Oh, sure. I've got out there. And they were like, oh, do you don't have any features? And no, these are our features. So I knew people were interested in horror way back. I mean, it was, and we always sold a lot of copies of Out There because it was the only horror I had. Um, so, you know, and I didn't do it just to make sales. I, I mainly did it because I felt like uh, I want the audience to, um, to get what they like. And if I'm going to ask them to watch some obscure, weird movie, then I should also give them what they want. You know, if I'm asking them to watch something that's outside their box, I should give them something inside the box. Definitely. Um, so um, I hear that you're actually making another film. Uh, that's correct. So uh, why don't you tell me about that, uh, that okay. project? So uh, our next film is, is a film called Brazen Impact. It's a crime film. So it's a color crime film, not, not a nor. And, uh, once again, it's it's something that I wanted to do uh, for a while. I've been wanting to do it for a while. Originally, I was going to shoot some stuff out in California, and that was really what was holding it up. It was just going to be a ton of money to fly out there and stay in a hotel, and and, and we were going to try to get a celebrity. Being it was just it was going to be thousands of dollars, and it just <laughs> I'm like, you know, am I going to keep waiting and waiting, or just you know, just drop those scenes and I could just start shooting the movie? So I, I just decided to drop those scenes and and shoot everything on the East Coast, and. Um, got the script written and, and uh, we started shooting um, even with COVID going on, we were about, we were able to get about 40% of the film done, including the grand uh, shootout uh, that's towards the end, which is the biggest scene in the film. So we were able to get that done. We also were able to get one of our celebrities uh, scene shot, uh, Sharon Smith Lentz, who played Sarah Collins on Dark Shadows. She was born as Collins. Kryptonite. Nice. So we were super excited. I'm a huge fan of Dark Shadows. So we're super excited to get her. Here too. 
<laughs> yeah, you remember you remember her. She was like Bar Barnabas could do anything, but when Sarah showed up, he was like just he couldn't kill, he couldn't hurt anybody because he was so guilty uh, for her. You know, when she died young, and 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 he he always blamed himself. So he he could he literally could not hurt anybody when she was there, and so I think that's made her one of the more interesting characters on there that she had that much power. You know. Now, was this your uh, first time working with her who was worked uh, on their shadows? Yes, it was. Okay. Uh, now, was there another uh, actor that you had wor uh, worked with from uh, who had been on the Dark Shadows? Or No, I, I'd, I'd wanted to for years, and okay. uh, I went to some of the conventions, and um, at the time, I just didn't really, I didn't really have... Um, anything to offer them because I was working on the Noor, I think back then. And I was just like, well, I wish I had a project where I hadn't cast everybody and I could get one of these people um, to be in it maybe. Um, but I didn't. And so it, it worked out here that, that this time we did work out Um, my, my buddy, Matt Burns, who, who uh, is one of the producers with us was, uh, he had a connection with, with Sharon and, and put us together. And I was able to, uh, uh, she liked the script. Nice. Um, and she was willing to to come on board because she liked the script. She didn't she didn't want to do horror. She wanted to do something different. So, um, and you know, it was it, it was a role for an actor. I mean, she had to act, and there was some emotion involved. And and you know, actors like that. They they like being challenged. They don't want to do the same thing over and over again. I, um, so if you can offer them something different, uh, uh, you know, that's still in their wheelhouse, um, it's hard for them to tell you no. Awesome. Do you have anything else waiting in, in the wings? Ideas. Uh, yeah, uh, then I got the next two ideas. Um, they're not written, but they're they're concepts. So the next idea is going to be a dark comedy. Um, the, the Worker Bees is a dark comedy, but that's a short. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a feature length dark comedy, and it's such a, a strong format. I mean, one of my, if not my favorite, one of my top two or three favorite movies of all time is The Big Lebowski. That's okay. a dark comedy. It's it's there's a plot, but it's I mean, talk about a funny movie. I mean, I, I don't know that there's a funnier movie than I mean, I'm a big fan of Caddyshack and Animal House and all those movies that everybody likes. Mm -hmm. um, Harold and Kumar. But and they're all good. But I don't know that any of them are as funny as the Big Lebowski. That that movie, I've, I bet I've seen it 40 times. And if I put it on right now, I would laugh at those jokes again. <laughs> I mean, it's just the characters are so strong and the interaction and it's just like, bam, 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 bam. It's really quick and really, it, you know, I love that. So I'd love to do something. I'm not going to copy the Big Lebowski, obviously. No. But I, I want to do something in that vein that's that's witty and upbeat and funny. And and um, so anyway, it's going to be that. I don't know exactly what it, it may have a stoner aspect to it, because I, I really thought Harold and Kumar was such a funny movie, too. Uh, 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 in the last 10 years, I think that's the funniest. I don't think I've seen a movie funnier than that since it came out. So maybe interact some of that in there too. And there was a little bit of a stoner aspect to uh, Big Lebowski too. So I think that's kind of funny and can work that in. So that's the next one. And then after that, we're going to return to horror, but uh, we're going to do it. A, we're not going to do the same thing. We're not going to do paranormal. We're not going to have a clown. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be more of a monster type movie. Okay. And um, I'm not exactly sure exactly how we're going to do it, but um, it, it's going to be, you know, I'm going to try to look at old movies and new movies that have monsters and maybe try to, to do something that ties both of them in, you know, the old movies are kind of, some of them are dated. Some of them are still, some of them still hold up. Oh yeah. Some of them are very dated, but, um, and then some of the modern monster movies just to me, just they're, they're just okay. But I have <laughs> seen a couple that, that were really good. So I'd, I'd kind of like to bring the relevant uh, at, at atmosphere of the old monster movies kind of into the modern the world, something like that. So there's going to, when I did taste of desperation, I, I kind of did the same thing. I did hours and hours of research. I listened to all these old vi uh, uh, audios of uh, detective stories that used to mm -hmm. air on, on the radio in the fifties and forties. And then I watched a ton of movies because I wanted to get the dialogue down. And, and once again, I wasn't trying to copy from any one movie, but what are the same, what are the things that every one of these movies has to have? They all have to have this. They all have to have that. So I'm going to do that with the monster movies. What do I have to do? And what do I have some 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 lot you know some room wiggle room on to kind of make it a little different? Mm -hmm. Most so definitely. that's the next two uh, things that we're going to do, and I don't have anything planned beyond that. We, we, we got to get these done first. <laughs> okay. Well, um, where exactly can we find uh, some of your films uh, that uh, 
um, maybe uh, some other people might uh, might not uh, know uh, where to purchase or find. Well, the watch. easiest way to do it, believe it or not, is to come to our website, which is absurd, A-B-S-U-R-D, productions, with an S, pictures.com. And on the, on, on the right-hand side, you will see uh, some icons. And for each movie, I have a link to the trailer and I have a link to where you can purchase it. Now, you could purchase these on Amazon. You could go on Amazon and search for each one. But it's mm -hmm. a lot easier just to do it on the website. And I put the trailers there so you can watch all, all of the well, – we don't have a trailer for Worker Bees, but every other film has its own trailer. You can watch the trailers and read about it and, and try to make a decision on which one you think you want to see before you spend your money. Um, right now, they're all DVD. We do have a couple of them that are streaming where you can buy an individual stream off of Amazon, like like you used to rent a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have anything on the um, the platform services where you pay a monthly fee and you can watch whatever you... Uh, I do, and I can't give any details because nothing is final yet, but I do have an agreement with a provider to make these films available through a pay a service where you pay a monthly fee and then you can watch them for free. I don't know when that's going to be available. And until it is available, until I know it's a green light, I really can't give any more details about it, unfortunately, but we will have several of our films available there for streaming. And, you know, it's just going to be night and day. That's what everybody does now. People don't generally rent a movie. Um, they usually, I know I don't, I mean, if, if something's, if something's not on prime or, or Netflix or one of the things then, uh, and, and I, I still get the DVDs from Netflix. So I usually can just rent the DVDs that way, but I'm not going to pay $3 to rent from Amazon. I'm just not. And so no. I know a lot of people aren't going to do that, uh, you know? And I know that your uh, movies are fairly t uh, cheap. I mean, you, you could charge an arm and a leg for, uh, uh, for, uh, for them, but you're really not you know, it, it going to be making any money if you charge like 25, 30 bucks a, yeah. pop, a pop, you know? So, <laughs> well, I have a philosophy about that. My, my goal, one of my goals is to make the films available. And I want to do that not only for me, I want to do that for my cast because the cast has worked hard to be in these movies. They've learned their lines. And in some cases they've got gore all over them or whatever. They've mm -hmm. had to travel for hours to shoot. And, and you know, one of the biggest pet peeves of, of actors that I've talked to is, They've done all these movies, but yet nobody can see them because these movies don't exist. They came out and then they disappeared. They never made DVDs of them. They never put them on a streaming service. So you've got people that have been in 50 movies and, and, and only have five of them that they can show. So I really want to make these available. And I, I make almost nothing on a sale. I mean, literally, literally almost nothing. But, and I could charge more money and make more. But like you said, I want people to buy the movies so, mm -hmm. so that the audience, so that the, the, the cast and myself, we can get exposure. Mm -hmm. We want people to see the film. So if I'm charging $25 so I can make a bunch of money and I'm not selling them, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and it also doesn't help the actors if they go tell their friends about it. And they're like, oh, yeah, I wanted to get that, but it was $25 and I had to pay post. <laughs> you know, people are going to do that. <laughs> right. In, in this day of, of, of streaming everything, you know, you're not going to do that. But I will say um, there is – still a lot of folks out there that like to buy like yourself, like myself mm -hmm. that like to purchase DVDs. And I'll be honest with you. I don't purchase Hollywood DVDs. Maybe every now and then, maybe every five years I'll buy one. Most of what I buy is independent stuff. I, I know that most of what I uh, uh, buy is not technically even mine, but, uh, but I prefer to have something physical on my shelf that I can just pull out at random instead of, clicking into a, a password and, and trying to squint your eyes just to see some uh, something on a, on a small screen or uh, e e even so I mean you're, you're on a TV, a TV you still got to punch in a password just to go stream some of the, uh, this uh, stuff and yeah. stream streaming eventually streaming services do expire. Yeah. So <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. You, you find, you know, how many times have you started watching a TV show? I mean, this has happened to us three or four times in the last year that we start watching. We started watching Justified that, you know, and, and Pat, by the third season, they took it away. So then we had to go back through all these other outlets to, to finish the series that we'd started. They, they take movies constantly away, big movies that everybody likes. And it's, you know, I know part of it is, is the licensing and, mm -hmm. and who they've sold to. 
but yeah, I'm with you. If I, you know, if I really like a movie and we talked about a movie like Alien or Big Lebowski, I want those on my shelf. I'm not going <laughs> to worry about whether or not some streaming service is carrying it because I'm going to watch that movie another 50 times in my lifetime. You know? Right. Uh, now, do you plan on uh, eventually, not that I care about the Blu-ray format, but, uh, but uh, do you plan on putting your films to Blu-ray format eventually? Well, um, what we're hoping to do this uh, now that we're into the new year is, is shop remnants to some um, distributors. And my guess is the distributor would probably want to do that. I wouldn't be against that. Um, for me personally, I probably uh, wouldn't do that just for me. Um, I don't really have a way right now of doing that. I mean, I, I, I'd have to figure out how to do it and all that. And just I do so, you know, the, the, one of the worst things about being a filmmaker in the modern world is you also have to be an IT expert. It, it's just, it, it's not like when I first started out where you had, it was more important to know the camera and, and the editing equipment and the sound equipment. Now, you, you, if you don't, can't do stuff on the computer, you, you know, you, you've got to make your, your films have to be out there on, even if you're selling DVDs, I mean, True. and you've got to hit all these formats and every whoever you go through their format is different than the other guy and, and i'll have 10 versions of stuff and this one's for them this one's for them <laughs> every one of them is different <laughs> yeah. no there's no standards so um the idea of of having to sit and do more it stuff to get a blu-ray i just i'd rather write another script than make the next movie but now a distributor they've got all that equipment set up and they could they could blow a, a, a blu-ray very easily so if we can get distribution for remnants, I, I imagine they would do a Blu-ray there. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate your you sp uh, spending some time with me uh, me here, uh, and uh, let me get to know. Uh, I actually do these interviews more for me to get to know the filmmakers and stuff, uh, stuff, but also to um, get, uh, let others get to uh, get to know you as well. So appreciate your time. Uh, spent here, and uh, hopefully, in the near in near future, I can have you uh, come back here on the sh uh, show and tell me about your next endeavor. Absolutely, Dave. I'd love to do that. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. And I did want to um, last thing. I just want to mention to everybody that um, what Dave mentioned at the beginning was a, this is our twentieth anniversary. So I did a promo. It actually came out on January first. And if you come to absurdproductionspictures.com you will see a, a logo right there. This is 20th anniversary and you'll see watch video, click that and it'll take you into a video where I go into the history of the company and we go over and, and Dave watched that. And that's how he was able to come up. Cause I told him, I said, Hey, take a look at that. You'll, you'll get some questions out of it. And so it's a good way. If you want to find out about what we've done and you know, see which ones you're interested in, that's a great way of doing it. That's why I put that together. You could watch that little video. And then when you come out of it, you go, wow, these three I'm really interested in. And then you could come to the website and watch the individual trailers and read more about the three you want. And then maybe narrow that to one or two that you're actually going to buy. So, and, and if, even if you don't, it's just a way to learn about what we're doing um, and what, and what we've done and will do. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, uh, once again for your time and your patience and uh, hopefully um uh, hopefully we get to see more from you so i hope so happy new year everybody uh and happy new year everyone and have a good afternoon evening or morning wherever you are thank you for watching